Good evening. My name is Shalia Ben. I am the Executive Director of the Native American Arts Center at Ida Wild Arts. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Michael Cabote Lecture Series. This summer, we had the opportunity to showcase four different lectures. We had one in-gallery lecture and three lunchtime lectures. They were so much fun that we wanted to put them all together and share them with you online so we could enjoy them once again. This evening, we're going to share a discussion that took place on the opening night of the exhibition, Still We Smile, Humor as Correction and Joy, curated by curator Miranda Roberts. It was an in-depth discussion about the use of humor in Native American cultures, and we had three artists that joined us that evening. I hope you enjoy the show. Before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that we are in the traditional homelands of the Kauai and Serrano people, and we're privileged to be here, so thanks to our, our cousins and our, our relatives. Um, this year, we wanted to talk about joy and humor. Uh, Taria, Emily are the program consultants, and we decided that we wanted to smile, we wanted to laugh this year, and so we were thinking about uh, really amazing kind of kick-ass you know, curators, and we're like, <laughs> we got to work with, them, with, with Miranda, and so... We worked on this all year long, and um, we really hope that you know people can learn from you know our our humor, our native humor, and humanize us as people. And so we thought that comedy was the perfect way to do that. <clears throat> um, I will go ahead and turn it over to Miranda, who will share more words and have have a discussion of kind of like how the concept came together. Um, what it's done for us personally in our own professional lives too, because um, you know everybody in their workspaces have experienced a lot, and, and art administrators and curators, uh, especially an artist too. Um, we need to you know enjoy ourselves and to um, heal ourselves from within using joy and humor and comedy. Uh, but those are also very strong tools about correcting behaviors, correcting. Uh, uh, preconceived notions of who people are. And so uh, we find that this show is very powerful in that regard. And thank you so much to the, um, the artists that are here to, uh, this evening. Um, we're very blessed to have you here and it's, it's a great joy. Oh, and then one thing. <laughs> we were talking yesterday about the setup and we're like, oh, what are we gonna do with this? I said, James always liked being the center of attention. So here you go. <laughs> this is dedicated to James Luna. Um, somebody that shaped and formed me as a very young person. And he's still here. I do want to acknowledge the Garth Gurning Gallery. Um, <clears throat> also drawn a big feather who helped a lot with um, getting the rights and you know getting us um, organized. Um, that was a lot of help and, and it, it means the, the world to us. And so without starting to cry, I'm gonna probably t turn it over. I also do wanna acknowledge our funders. Uh, without their support, this does not happen. Our program sponsors, FNX, uh, KCBR, and PR, uh, Caliente, an anonymous foundation, <clears throat> the Chickasaw Nation, the Morongo Band of Mission Indians, San Manuel, Saboba Band of Luceno Indians, Saboba Foundation, San Pascual, Tassin, and San Manuel. I think I just said that again. All right, so I'll let Miranda take it away, and thank you all for being here. Kia Yay. Thank you, Shay. Yes, round of applause. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so honored to be here tonight. Um, my name is Dr. Miranda Roberts. I'm a citizen of the Yerington Paiute tribe and Mexican-American. Um, I grew up in the Inland Empire, um, mostly. And I have some notes on my phone. I'm a little nervous. Um, I'm going to try to crack a joke every once in a while, but I'm not that funny. <laughs> so I just want to kind of give like some context to what you're about to see. Um, and then in that, introduce my wonderful and esteemed colleagues and friends and artists. So when Shalia asked me to curate this exhibition, my mind immediately thought of James Luna. For me personally, I remember the moment in grad school at UC Riverside when I began learning about Mr. Luna's work. Artifact piece, the performance artifact piece, it left a really big mark on me considering the reality that he would put himself inside of an actual case and actually like put sacrifice a lot of himself and all of those things. And I just thought, wow, like this person gets it. And although I never had the opportunity to meet James or Mr. Luna, um, I just felt when I just felt like it was a call to have to honor him in some way. Um, so immediately um, when that happened, I thought of when I saw James's piece at the Forge Project was in upstate New York, um, where I first saw 
Rachel Martin's work also, who is Plinkett, <laughs> here with us. And her lovely work is the ones on the wall right here. Um, and I just started to think about, for example, um, what her, her work represents in terms of sharing ancestral love um, through making sure her ancestors are alive on the pages that she creates. Um, you see them in motion, you see them smiling, you see them engaged. And having worked in an institution where um, a lot of cultural items from her community were put behind glass, are seen as curiosities, um, and are not appreciated for what they really are, I just, it brought so much joy to see them in this light. And so, and Rachel's just a bright light in the world as well. So it made perfect sense. And so they were my two, I guess, muses, I guess that's a good, yeah. <laughs> that's a good word um, to kind of, as my jumping off point. So how do we express love within our community for our ancestors and then honoring James um, in some way, shape or form. And at first we weren't too sure what we were gonna have from um, Mr. Luna, but we were lucky enough to get this um, hot medicine bag, which is a part of the um, institution, Idlewild here, that had to be broken out of a case <laughs> um, and create this pedestal. And then this lovely video here that um, Miss Wendy Weston gifted for this exhibition, who was a dear friend and who was starring in the video. She is Danae. <laughs> she is a star and I will let you decide who she looks like or who she looks like. <laughs> you will know when you see her in the video. <laughs> Um, and um, that came together very naturally. Um, let me see what else happened. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then I also wanted pieces from that where non-Native people didn't know if they should laugh at it or point to like certain behaviors that non-Native people do when trying to learn more about us or when trying to like avoid learning about us, right? Like, for example, Zig Jackson's work, which is in the back wall over here, that is a tourist taking a picture of a man in his regalia and Zig is taking the picture of the man. Like, see how, like, look how invasive you are being, right? It looks funny to us. Like, I'm like, dang, you're close. <laughs> Why are you in my face? But, uh, and then the, there's a child in there who's smiling, right? Who's kind of oblivious, maybe, to what's happening. Um, and so I really just wanted to, people to kind of think about that a little bit deeper. Um, and then we have Jeremy Dennis's work, who is a part of the Shinnecock Nation at the end here. Um, and I have loved Jeremy's work since I worked at the Field Museum. Um, when I first came across it, I was very, I laughed pretty hard because um, I was noticing the non-native um, community members I was with at the time, but make, it made them uncomfortable. They weren't sure if they were supposed to laugh at it. They didn't know if they were supposed to be in on the joke. They didn't know if we were poking fun at them. So a little of them, they seemed like offended. Like, why are you making fun of us? <laughs> But in reality, it shows, you know, that we are here in every sense of the word, right? You can't avoid being in your house. You're still on native land. Um, so really putting that out there. And then with River's work, who is right here, River Garza, <laughs> Tongan and Chicano. Um, of course, he did this beautiful piece to honor Mr. Luna. But we were talking earlier about this particular piece. And when I was looking at it, I was smiling and laughing because it points to so many familial things that I grew up here in Southern California. There's like certain landmarks, the Billy Jack hats. Um, I, I always wonder why Native people like Billy Jack, um, but I understand it at the same time too. So like putting that into question. Um, and so I just wanted people to like really dig deep and think about how have you observed Native culture? And then how are we making sense of the world around us through joy and animation? Um, and then lastly, um, we couldn't have them here today, but Shayla Zahn LaRue is a two-spirit drag queen from the Dean Nation in Saskatchewan. And I included her because, as you all know, our two-spirit relatives are being completely harmed at right now. And I feel like she embodies the community members that I grew up around or the people that I grew up around seeing, the aunties, the correcting the behavior, calling people shit asses. <laughs> you know, showing what anti-love is. And if you know what anti-love is, then you know what anti-love is. And if you don't, I hope you do one day. Um, and so I just really wanted to bring together these very unique perspectives over, yeah, just how do we express joy? How do we kind of point to what non-native people are doing? Um, and then how do we keep some humor for ourselves, right? Some of this humor, you don't always understand because it's not meant for you to understand completely, right? Like, and that's okay. 
So that's kind of the concept. I don't want to take up too much more time because I want them to speak more than me. Um, so I created a foundational question and I will, anyone is open to answer it first, but um, the humor we, we become exposed to as native people. Um, I lost the question. Okay, the humor we become exposed to at a young age is very much an extension of cultural lessons and our familial relationships. How have these experiences shaped your practice? Or you could talk about each piece. I don't, <laughs> whoever wants to go first. Um, I'll start. Okay. My mom is an artist, so from a really young age, she was instilling in me that I didn't actually have to um, show reality. I really needed to show a feeling. So as an artist, that's really the most valuable thing I have is to make sure that it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be realistic to what's happening. It really is the most important thing is the feeling of something. So um, a lot of the times my humor will come out subtly because it's just naturally there. Um, and that's how that younger start happened. That's mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On to the next. Yeah, I guess I could speak to that. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I guess what comes to mind is like thinking of like all the you know hilarious aunts and uncles that I have in my family. My own parents are really funny. It's just like humor has been a, just a big part of like growing up, like in the native community. Like you get corrected on things, taught certain things, and like humor has just been such a integral part of like I guess my upbringing. So always thinking that in mind, and like again thinking of. Yeah, spending time with people and like trying to capture that uh, kind of like ephemeral moment. Um, I don't know, I try to embrace that in some ways in, in the work that I create. Like um, that the humor side of things has always really resonated. I think um, the way it is articulated and expressed sometimes is very much like on the nose or sometimes it's like super subtle things, like things that you'll catch if you, like for example, if you grew up in LA, like certain things like aesthetically or conceptually will resonate. But um, yeah, I think just thinking of like my family members, um, it was like just really fun I'm just trying to capture that and trying to continue that same uh lineage of, of humor and bringing it into especially like um, art spaces i think at times which could be very very stuffy um very formalized i think at times it could be very antithetical to the way that yeah we're brought up so yeah that's what i think of Do you want to <laughs> um, well good evening everyone um well I'm the elder in the group, and when I was a child, I grew up in the Four Corners region of the United States uh, uh, in the Southwest, and the Pueblo groups in Arizona and New Mexico, as well as my tribe, the Diné or Navajo, um, when I was a kid, we would be really serious in a ceremony. Everybody's sitting there, and you're doing this, all of a sudden, the medicine man would say something, and everybody would start laughing. It would be like a joke. And so... And then, and I asked, what, I thought we're, you know, supposed to be helping in the healing. They said, we are, that laughter is healing. Mm -hmm. So that, this is the way it is. And so in the Pueblo villages and at Hopi, during their ceremonies, you see what, what is translated in English as clown, but it's not a clown. It is a person, it is that holy being that comes to life during those ceremonial times and teaches us about our behaviors, about good behavior, about bad behavior, um, and they they do it that way. So I don't I don't know that I agree with that word clown, um, but it we don't have anything else to translate it to. So growing up, that was all around me in Oklahoma in the powwowing tribes of Osage, Delaware, Quapaw, They have. Um, a clown image who actually dresses up like a circus clown who comes to powwows and dances and that was a certain society of men that did that back in the early 1900s and so that was this has always been part of who we are as indigenous communities and so we always employ humor in everything that we do because that is the way we keep the balance in our world so, go ahead. Um. Well, I'm um, from the Shinnecock Nation, and we're in what is known as the Hamptons today, where the top one percenters live. And so um, it's really absurd that we live in this low-income community next to the wealthiest people on Earth. 
And so just that experience growing up in that environment for 30 years, there's just so many things that are problematic, like historical injustices, imbalance that is within grit, uh, grasp, that gets so easily um, solvable with the wealth that's there. And yet we, or I should say our neighbors tend to ignore it. They try to render us invisible. And so that absurdity um, <laughs> is something that uh, turns into humor because we have all the logic in front of us. Everyone knows the same information and yet we're unwilling to do anything about it. So you have to go beyond logic and beyond sense and that becomes humor. And so how do you use that as um, reinterpreting our current condition? And so I try to do that through art. Um, more recently, we were talking about our history and where we came from, but I like to do it now in memes as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I was also hoping that you all would speak a little bit to these pieces that are on display. I know Jeremy did a little bit, but Rachel, could you give us a little bit of more information about the three pieces in front and what inspired you and yeah. what they encapsulate? Yes. Um, when it comes to, you were speaking earlier about the work that's at the Met and a lot of cultural belongings that are in institutions and they're just a lot of masks um, and they're separated from the actual spirit of the human beings. So a lot of the times through my work, I'm humanizing um, our people because we're very much alive and very much a part of the land still. So the idea of um, my work is to one, make sure that my indigenous audience is very like seen and feels represented. And then also um, communicating that the masks that you're seeing in these institutions are truly attached and cultural belongings to people and we want them back. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, that's that for those specific pieces um, in the collages that I'm working on right now. River. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the two paintings behind me. Uh, one of this one right here is like an, an earlier work. Um, Rand was talking to me earlier, and as I reflect, I think it's like one of the first paintings I ever made. So I think it um, for me it was like a like a big thing. Uh, to start painting and I guess embrace the practice of, of being a painter and owning that identity like a lot of the early work that I was making was a a lot of collage based work a lot of like family photos documents um, incorporating that type of stuff but um, yeah there's always been this desire to paint um, but I didn't know quite how to go about it I guess I consider myself like self-taught or peer taught so engaging in that and calling myself like a painter felt like a very heavy task because I think of like the lineage of, of painting um, so yeah, like when I wanted to make these things, I wanted to make something that I felt was true to myself and integrates like all the eclectic interests that I, that I have and aspects of, of my identity and the, and the self. And I think at the time too, what I was studying at, um, got my degree in native studies at Cal Fly Pomona. So I think at that time too, like becoming like politicized in some sense. So like thinking about that type of stuff and integrating that inside the type of the work that I wanted to create. And then the work on the right, the portrait of James Luna, um, I made that, started that piece while in residency at IAIA. Um, they have like such an amazing library there on campus and I was able to see like an artist catalog of James' work and just felt really just deeply inspired um, by the type of work that he's created. I think it's like fair to say like in my own work like there's a period of like uh, like pre, being exposed, pre, be, okay, how do I even articulate this? Like, yeah, like, uh, pre-James Luna exposure, post-James Luna that, exposure. Yeah, 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 you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah so that, and like, um, and like I've seen like James work like growing up, like just being a little of the native community, like, oh yeah, I know that piece. And then as I got older and like really started to, uh, I guess embrace myself and in, in the craft and really understand form and concept, his, his work really resonates. Um, so yeah, I think like trying to continue in the same lineage of like humor, but also being like very critical at the same time, so. Yeah, I think that's the inspiration for that. And before we move to, thank you, to um, Wendy, who I'm very excited to hear from. Um, a big reason, a, bar, a big part of my curation, I, people say curation is an art form. I don't, you know. It is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was first, I didn't know Shalia until last year personally. Um, and then when I saw the picture hanging forward of half Indian, half Mexican, um, she began to open up about how close her family and she was to uh, Mr. Luna. And when they asked me to curate this, I always bring, what does my community, meaning Shalia, her, her family, the Kuiya, what do they want 
to be shown. And I heard, you know, from Wendy, a lot of times there is no artist like James Luna right now, right? And we deserve to continuously talk about him in these spaces because he consistently pushes the envelope still, even though he's not with us physically anymore. So I wanted to honor all of the work that they do that's here, as well as we can honor him through the work that he did here, right? Um, um, and so it was important for me to encapsulate that into this exhibition because my, I, my curation has often been a source of pain <laughs> because of the institutions I've worked at, but I really wanted this to be a sense of joy and a sense of love. And I could feel that every time Wendy and Shalia were talking to me about Mr. Luna. And so that was also a big reason why I'm so honored to have these two pieces is it speaks to the longer story of Idlewild. It speaks to this longevity. And so I just wanted to preface that a little bit before we pass it to Wendy, who can tell us all about James. Um, <laughs> in, let, let's see, 1987, I was uh, running around being an artist, making a living doing that with the artist's husband and little kids. And I met James Luna and we became fast friends. And then he said one day, he's like, girlfriend, I'm going to do this thing at San Diego Museum of Man. So what are you going to do? He's like, oh, I'm going to jump in a case and be part of the, the exhibit. <laughs> so Museum of Man used to have a big um, show there um, at the museum every summer. And so on, in 87, he decided to do that. And he would, he would do these things. He would talk about his work and what he was wanting to do. And then, but he was very, very nervous and very, very conscious of who and what was going on around him. So he would often get people to be, um, to be placed in the, the crowd, to be the spies. So I got to do that a lot. And um, so after it's all over, so you sit there and you watch how people act, and then he gets done with his artifact pieces. So what do you think? Did I get him? Did anybody get shocked? Did it, you know? And so there was a whole debrief that would go on past that. In 1992, the quincentennial was going on of Columbus finding us. And so there was a group of probably about 30 contemporary American Indian artists that got together. And it was an organization that I was working for at the time called Atlatl. It was an art service organization that um, convened contemporary artists to talk about you know, how, how they could be more effective in the field and how they could move forward, push the envelope, say what we want to say, not make art that the institutions want us to make because, you know, we, we all sat in classrooms as young kids and the teacher would say, oh, can you draw a teepee? Oh, you're an artist. You know, no, that's not even right. So uh, the Submullock Show was an exhibition that was curated by Atlatl in 1992 as a response to the quincentennial. And people like Rick Bartow, Jean Quick to see Smith, James Luna, Michael Cabote, we, everybody, we all sat in a room and they're like, let's give it back to them. We're gonna joke about it. We're gonna make it funny. We're gonna use humor to put it back on the people that think what they discovered. They, they're very ignorant because they obviously didn't discover anything or this, this man. So that, that show traveled all over the country, probably about 20 venues, and I do have the catalog I gotta give to you. <clears throat> but Luna, uh, Luna's piece, half Indian, half Mexican, was part of the Submullock show. And I say that because that, that issue back in 1992 about what's your blood quantum, where's your community, who, you know, how much Indian blood are you? They were still, we were battling about that back then, and it's still being talked about today. You would have thought that we would have gotten past that now. And by we, I say my contemporaries, our people. So this was a funny response. The, uh, the show traveled to smaller institutions. It wasn't in the major institutions because they couldn't handle that kind of honesty. It did go to the Heard Museum in Phoenix, which at the time was, had an open ear to the Native community. They don't any longer. <laughs> um, and I, hey, I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, but they, there were people who were offended by, because I was in that scene at that time. They were very offended by what was being presented through that. So what did I do? I said, Uncle James. Well, I'm, I used to call him Mr. Luna. My children, he 
sat them down and said, call me Uncle James. Never call me anything else but Uncle James. So I said, why don't you come to the herd and do something? So that's when all this take a picture with an Indian, um, in my dreams, all of those pieces started morphing during that time. And so we were sitting around one day and the women in that video, one of them is a filmmaker, Arlene Bowman. She's been around for a long time, did a lot of good film work in the 70s and 80s. And the other person in there, um, we, were, we were his Bond girls. And so we was talking about James Bond and how James Bond was a superhero and how he was a superhero, but he didn't like, you know, the, the same type of, his, his idea of a perfect female wasn't the same as a Barbie doll. So that's where we're in that film. <laughs> and so the other person that's in that film too is Margaret, was Margaret Archuleta, who was a curator at the Heard Museum for a long time and the person who um, first thought of the boarding school exhibit, which is an exhibit that's been up there for about 30 years now and continues to move people um, in all kind of emotions um, because it's there. So she was the curator at that time. We brought brought him to the herd, um, got in trouble from the administrators for having, you know, out there wild Indian that's drinking beer and eating spam in, in the auditorium. And, um, but a lot of that was, he's like, you know, you hear that, that saying, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> you can't, you know, we're, as native people, man, we have all these, these, these things that are part of our culture and we have, some of them are so horrible that we have to laugh at them because that laughter is what helps us get through it. Um, and he, he was, he grew up in that pain and he knew that pain but he also knew healing, and he really, really wanted our young people to um, continue to be strong. And I would often listen to him, he'd be visiting, and he'd have my daughter sitting him down and saying, all right, now you girls never take shit from anyone. Don't let a man do this. <laughs> you know, you be strong Indian women. You make me proud, and I'm gonna be proud. So um, I do agree, it is very appropriate that he's here in the middle because um, he would have walked in and said, damn it, this is just where I belong. <laughs> so um, we, I, a lot of the questions that came up in those times 30 years ago are still relevant today, and our young people are facing those same types of questions. And so um, I appeal to my contemporaries to find someone to mentor so that we can move, you know, that, that um, conversation forward maybe in a spirit of of healing eventually so go ahead uh, oh, jeremy has to go out i know <laughs> <laughs> Should we just grab some wine and, <laughs> and cheese yeah. um well I, I look up to james luna so much um especially the um, performance piece just because um with the four works behind me. It is a lot of self-portraiture. It's a lot of um, performing. Um, I sometimes describe it as an Indian playing an Indian. Um, I also feel like I have to apologize <laughs> when I show this work with um, Native audiences, just because um, it is in the realm of um, Fred Wilson playing around with um, offensive memorabilia, um, Kara Walker using um, uh, enslavement imagery as well. And so um, the way that I use the indigenous figure in each one of these images is almost as if it's a, um, okay, we're entering this room for conversation. I know we all don't have to talk about our history and the conflict of this land, but these are um, in many different ways, um, just an invitation using humor to talk about those difficult um, histories of our shared trauma. And so it's a series called Rise, um, R-I-S-E, and it's parallel between the idea of um, zombies and popular culture. Um, so it's, I'm not gonna say the whole story, <laughs> but Noam Chomsky was the influence for this project. He was um, asked by an MIT student, why is um, like the rising dead and the walking dead so popular in this country? And he paralleled it to, there's this great force that we have to defeat even though we're oppressing this force. 
in that case, it's um, African Americans, um, the fear that they'll come back um, and uh, attack us for what we did to them. Same with indigenous people and genocide and the idea that we want to, we as indigenous people want to come, be violent and wipe out white people. And so those are absurdities and yet they still persist in our uh, popular imagination. And so going back to the zombie popular culture, it's the undead rising to haunt the living. And in my case, it's a um, supposed vanished race of people, but never really disappearing. And so it pulls a lot from horror movies, uh, scary movies, the idea of invisibility. The first one is just my personal fear of like when you open the curtain and like you see a silhouette or someone out there. I think we all know the scream. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's over a hundred um, images in this series, and you'll notice there's no um, stereotypical weapons like bow and arrows or tomahawks or anything like that. Um, as Miranda just stated, our presence alone evokes that same fear of other movies that have these immortal monsters that are endlessly coming to kill the protagonist. And that fear comes from the very fact that if we acknowledge indigenous people, their sovereignty, their resilience, then we'll actually have to um, enact action on that fact. And so there's so many uh, broken treaties that need to be reconciled from that. And so I tried to use this series as a way of um, showing that we have something that's shared, something that's unresolved, something we have to work on in this nation. And so this brings us to this third image. This is very much Hamptons-esque, just the abundance, the wealth, the um, serving oneself. And this one is uh, funny because um, there's an idea for this series that I want to do in the realm of the Wizard of Oz and the, um, the witch is underneath the house. And in the <laughs> case of my series, I want to show that um, indigenous people have been here um, Im immovable in a way. And houses have been built on places that our ancestors still remain. And so this final one, I'm just going to say briefly, is from the new Jurassic Park uh, movie with the three raptors. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that movie bombed, so not, so not a popular <laughs> reference. Yeah. Awesome. Um, with that, I also wanted to ask, um, is it okay? I guess this is something I'm trying to word it right. How should non-Native people, are they allowed to laugh at these like our artwork right that is visibly right like visibly funny they're not sure what it is like how should non-native people approach this type of art like are with their uncertainty should they feel uncomfortable what should we tell them about being uncomfortable and like that i know we've had this discussion in the morning <laughs> a little bit <laughs> um skip me for now while i think about this i know everyone's like great <laughs> Okay, Wendy, okay. Well, I think it's important as Native people, you know, the, uh, the last couple of years there's been this big phenomenon, the land acknowledgement. Well, you know what? Um, when I introduce myself in my, land, my tribal language, that is my land acknowledgement, and it gives that land acknowledgement, and so it's already been there. And so we know in, in that way, a lot of other tribes do that too. In that way, you know where you're from. So if you don't know who you're from, and you can't laugh about something, then maybe if you looked inside and found out where you were from, you could laugh at that because you could find some commonalities. So when you say non-native people, should they laugh at it? Well, if they can, why not? Just like, I'll, I'll laugh at them. I don't understand a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I, mean, I know, but this is what you said. I know what you mean. <laughs> But I'm, I know it's. I know people get offended because they say, "Well, why are you laughing at the Indians?" And it's like, "Well, you know, maybe we're laughing at you." Right. You know, That's you what. Know? Yeah. So, but I, I, I just think it's important for, for people, to know where they're from, because when you have that foundation, then you can laugh, mm -hmm. with a free heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, ready to go. <laughs> um, I think the my. My intention for my work is always to evoke joy and specifically to um, a Native audience, but everyone is welcome. And if everybody gets joy from looking at my work in some sort of way, then that's really great. Um, a lot of my work is evoking um, the like 
specifically a feminine figure, which is not often in Northwest Coast art. It's usually totems and um, male figures. So it's important for me to encourage indigenous younger women to feel like they're a part of the dialogue. So um, there should always just be some sort of joy that is a part of my work. And that's my intention. I like that. Can I inject one more thing? Yes. This, <laughs> I talk a lot. Um, Mr. Luna passed away in 2018, and in 2017, I was working with a group of kids in Anchorage, Alaska. There were 50 of them, and we had them in a three-day workshop, and we were teaching them about service projects and how to serve your community through planning a project. So there were 50 kids there. Luna calls me up. He's like, hey, girlfriend, what are you doing? I said, I'm in Anchorage. Why are you bothering me? He said, what? I'm here, too. He was at the Anchorage Museum of Art. Is that the, the swanky one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm doing a performance and I want you to bring these kids because that's my audience. I don't care about these people. My first audience is my native people. And if they laugh and there's one person in the room and they laugh, then I have done my job. Everybody else can sit there. So this is a some mainstream, you know, white Eurocentric museum. He told the people, Okay, my friend's bringing 50 Indian kids to this performance. And we got, they were like in the first three rows and they saw his performance and he made this big announcement that, you know, my young uh, Indian native brothers and sisters are here and I'm so happy and this performance is for you. But that's who he did his work for. And that's who we do our work for, is ourselves first. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is. That's a great, no, that's great. It is. Mm -hmm. Hmm, I guess I'll speak next. Um, when you first posed that question, I think I have like mixed feelings. Um, yeah, because and hearing everyone speak, like the more I think about it, yeah, like my work is definitely intended for, you know, indigenous people, my family, the homies, like all that type of stuff is really important to me. So that's like what the work is oriented for. And I think like at times the apprehensiveness to, to laugh or find some of these things, humor only speaks to like the preciousness that like non-native folks have towards us our culture and i think that speaks in terms like the romanticization of you know our people but um i don't know like that's just funny like it's funny i don't know. i think it's okay to laugh you know so i think that's an important thing too and again i think like part of the work especially like, personally like very, some of it is like very nuanced and like those nuances are there for a reason and they're to speak to like a certain audience so yeah yeah um, oh, definitely um, <laughs> laughing with us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the work that's behind me um, deals with themes of war, war um, genocide, land theft, and yet um, the entry point is humor and laughter and connection. And so, in a way, it's almost like a um, like a, a bad trip or a bad gummy that you enter into it, <laughs> sticks with you, and then later on, you're like, oh wait. There's something that I have to say. <laughs> like, that was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> that was real. I think that that's an important, and we're about a few more minutes. Um, I think that's all what I think what I'm hearing is, um, at least from my point of view and why I'm so happy we're in conversation with each other, is bringing these, all of these different perspectives right into conversation shows you ways in which that we are engaging in healing and understanding the world around us. Um, I have also been thinking about like, how do we feel about being a native artist? Um, whenever I'm with Gerald, whenever he's here, you know, what does it mean to be a native artist um, in this world? Um, and how does it translate to the idea of humor, right? Like, um, I think a lot of people, as I say in the introductory text, really see us in the lens of trauma and very much in the lens of loss. And that's how they want to learn about us because you know what is that the I can't think of the word right now but um where they just want to see us in pain all the time you know like they just want to see us struggling and in reality we're here thriving but they don't know the best ways of learning from us and I feel like everyone here is saying to come in and be welcome and learn from us uh, we're kind we're good people but we're gonna hold you accountable also right if you do something that offends us or maybe is not okay um, and so I guess one of the last questions I'll ask is, what keeps you full of joy, Rachel? And everyone, what, is, what keeps you going, especially because the world is really messed up since 2018. <laughs> and there's been so many highs and so many lows, right? And so 
how do we embrace joy um, and how do we help others embrace joy? Um, I think what brings me a lot of joy is um, I'm a language learner, Tlingit language learner, so a lot of elders um, are just instilling tradition um, in, into me and through my work I'm also going into the next generation and making sure that they also see themes of tradition that they can also see themselves in. So the idea of a generation behind me being inspired by my work is what really brings me joy. Um, so I make sure to try to get a lot of input from my elders in order to um, make sure that the work that I'm putting out there is representative of our ancestors. So that brings me a lot of joy. And it really is working where the humor of the work makes um, people feel included in the um, work. And that is really what brings me joy. That's a good question. Um, I guess what comes to mind is um, like, like very little like process stuff, like the process of creating brings me joy, like as like cliche as that is, um, it's cathartic, but, but joyful. Um, but also like having the opportunities to teach like, again, like young folks, even older folks, just um, continuing this tradition of like reciprocity. I think that brings me a lot of joy. Um, and is honestly like the most fulfilling work outside of like, you know, doing this type of stuff is beautiful, but seeing and like nurturing that creativity in other people and seeing it like blossom and bloom is, um, is extremely profound. So I find a lot of joy in that. And um, also I think of like, um, one of my favorite artists in the room, Gerald Clark, must say, like this notion of continuum and like continuing like the same, like, you know, not the same tradition, but like the embracing this creative spirit that has existed like amongst our people since time immemorial. So I'm embracing that, like knowing I'm a part of that and we can hopefully someday like influence and help people become a part of that too. That brings me a lot of joy. Yeah. Well, besides my family, <laughs> what brings me the most joy is you young people. Um, seeing you young people moving forward and doing these things and continuing to ask these questions. We went through the gauntlet for you guys to be able to sit here and speak like this. And I'll bet you um, no one's going to come and attack you and call you a racist after you're done. We've, I've been through that. I'm looking at my friend over here. We've been through that because we, we talked about these things back in the 80s and it wasn't, women didn't do it, Indians didn't do it, you know, and how dare we. So the joy is in your young people. And I know that's the joy in Luna's heart because that's, he always talked about that, um, our young people. But you guys, without realizing it, you really put a, a native tone in this night because you're all in, inclusive um, because we have everything represented here. And I say that because I'm an elder, but I'm with these young people because we belong with young people. Young people belong with us. That's our way. We don't get put away when we're old. We get taken care of by our young people and we feed them as well. So that's my joy. Thank you. Mm. 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 Uh, uh, well, joy for me comes from uh, just celebrating um, being Shinnecock. Just because when I was growing up, um, even starting in high school, um, my fellow classmates would say, um, like all the Shinnecock, all the native people are dead. Why do we learn this stuff? And so just the fact that we're educating um, through the arts and other means is very empowering. It's allowing us to feel like we belong in society today. And so I think that that joy alone is so um, essential. <laughs> it's something that um, we need to just magnify. It's like never enough. We have to catch up to um, get to that point of just constant joy. Thank you for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the lecture and learned a few things and had a few laughs along the way. Be sure to visit our website for future online lecture series. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>